And hello, everyone that's coming in. Uh, we're going to keep welcoming uh, everyone that's uh, joining the live streaming of the presentation. Uh, my name is Adriana Filstrup, and I'm the Visitor Services Manager and uh, Fellow Supervisor um, at the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Uh, I'm going to uh, mute everyone for the sake of uh, the quality of the sound so far. All right. So this is the third year of uh, the fellows presentations and this work today culminates a 10 month fellowship that has been possible thanks to a generous donation by fund to foundation, which carries a diverse me mission uh, to preserve African American the African-American experience, advocate for human rights, music education, and entrepreneurialism, awarded by businessman and philanthropist Robert F. Smith. We have witnessed year by year the empowerment that this fellowship has provided to young professionals who have engaged with the operations of this 20-year uh, organization, a museum, and the largest archives dedicated to a single jazz musician worldwide. Thanks also to a uh, 2.7 million uh, grant um, by Fund to Foundation, 90% of the collections are digitized and available to be searched for free on our website, louisarmstronghouse.org. The museum prepares now for the opening of a new center that will hold the over 60,000 items that comprise today the long archival collections. Uh, we'll have there also a 70 seat performance venue and a state of the art exhibit across the street from the Louis Armstrong House in Corona, Queens. Besides leading countless tours uh, to museum visitors, our fellows have each chosen a topic uh, of their preference to explore its significance in the large picture of American culture, just history, and African American history. We hope you enjoy with us the knowledge and enthusiasm that their findings bring us today. And I will let, uh, let Highland Harris uh, introduce them and their work. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, my name is Highland Harris. Uh, I'm a manager at the Louis Armstrong House Museum, and I want to welcome everybody to our presentations. Uh, the mission of the Louis Armstrong House Museum and the archives is to sustain and promote the cultural, historical, and humanitarian legacy of Louis Armstrong by preserving and interpreting his, the Armstrong's house and collecting collections, as well as sharing archival materials that document our Louis Armstrong's life and legacy. We would also like to thank the continuing support of the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation and the Kufferberg Center of the Arts at Queens College for our years of support. Uh, now, every year we look forward to our fellows to share with us and the public their research over the course of the last academic year and I had the pleasure of working alongside these two fine young people coming up. Uh, I learned so much from them. Hopefully they learned as much as I did from them as well from us. Uh, now, our two fellows this year are Jazz Milligan, and she is the LAM Fellow from 2019 to 2020. Uh, she obtained her undergraduate degree at Temple University in 2018 in film and media uh, with a minor in history. Uh, she's a Harlem native. She now attends CUNY Graduate Center, uh, where she's in the process of obtaining her master's degree in liberal studies with a concentration in women, gender, and sexuality studies. She's also an avid runner on her free time. Uh, 
Our second fellow is Javon Slaughter. Uh, he's also our fellow from 2019, 2020, and a graduate of the University of, and he's uh, beginning his graduate studies at the University of Houston uh, in September. Uh, Javon received his BA in history from North Carolina Central University, concentration in public history and African diaspora. Javon is a graduate of Johnson and Wales University where he's trained to become a professional chef, earning a degree in culinary arts. Uh, today, Javon's research centers around African-American diasporic food pathways and history through the lens of public history. As a fellow, Javon explores methods of presentation, presenting African-American history via Louis Armstrong's house and archives to the public through research projects and interpretive historic house tours. Javon plans on continuing working within the realm of public history as he continues his graduate studies. Now, a common thread between both these presentations is the dissemination of influence, how influence is spread. Uh, now, Lewis, as a young musician uh, and a young professional, before he became this international star, he accompanied and recorded with these tremendously pivotal, powerful women. These would include Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, Alberta Hunter, Sippy Wallace, and Victoria Spivy. Uh, his second wife, who is criminally underrepresented in historic context, Lil Armstrong, would go on to exert tremendous influence on Lewis that would lay the foundations of Lewis becoming later an international figure. These presentations will examine the web of both recognized and underrecognized women in jazz as well as Lewis's international influence, which continues to this day. Uh, if one has any questions, we will ask you to send them via chat, and Jazz and Javon will ask, answer these questions after this second presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Jazz for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Hyland. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen so we can get started. Then okay. okay, well, hello everyone. Thank you, Highland, for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Um, like you said, my name is Jazz Milligan, and I am a Louis Armstrong House Museum Fellow. Today, for my final presentation, I want to talk about women in jazz. Women have always been major performers in jazz and have contributed to its success. But whenever people discuss jazz musicians, they mention King Oliver, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, and Charlie Parker. All of these musicians that I mentioned are men. Men are not the only ones contributing to jazz, yet why does society tend to focus on their accomplishment? The answer is sexism. While there are a few women whose accomplishments have been well documented, such as Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, these women were singers, which is seen as an acceptable mm -hmm. position for a woman in a band. It was acceptable for a woman to be a singer rather than a musician because of the sexist ideas that women were better suited to sing rather than perform with the instrument. In the South, bands that performed usually did this on the street with large groups of men. Women walking through the street with men with, hev with a heavy instrument was seen as unbecoming and unladylike. Even before jazz was created, women were contributing their talent to the industry. Women like Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, and others gave the foundation for the singing style and content of jazz. These women sung about cheating men, traveling around the country, 
relationships, and the new experiences that Black people were having at the turn of the century after emancipation. So for my presentation, I want to talk about the context surrounding the treatment of women in jazz, the careers of three women, Valeda Snow, Lillian Hardin Armstrong, and Ethel Waters, and why these women are not talked about as much as their male peers, and how women today are still dealing with discrimination. For the three women in my presentation, I want to talk about their success and how they were limited because of their gender. And then later on, I want to talk about how female jazz artists today are still important and the struggles that they go through have not changed over the years. So to begin, I want to talk about early women performers starting in the 1900s. Women performers captured the emotions and thoughts of African Americans during the turn of the 20th century. New inventions and new opportunities allowed for people to get new jobs. Early women performers also highlighted the struggles of working class African Americans. A book by Angela Davis explores the legacies of blues singers. The book is titled Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. In the book, Davis writes, for example, about how Bessie Smith's music helped to forge for Northern African Americans a collective consciousness rooted in memories of the South were re-articulated with the Northern Black working class experience. And on this, what you see on your screen here, I have a picture from our archives, and it's an album that Lewis did where he played along blues singers, such as Clara Smith and Blanche Calloway, who is also a performer in her own right, and also the sister of Cab Calloway. During the 1900s and 1910s, the blues began to merge with ragtime and became jazz. This mix of blues and ragtime, which would eventually become jazz, started in New Orleans. New Orleans. In New Orleans, bands would perform on the street and in clubs. Soon this new form of music would spread from Louisiana to across the US and around the world. This spread happened because after World War I, people began to migrate to northern cities in large numbers in a movement called the Great Migration. The Great Migration was a movement of African Americans from the South to the North, beginning in 1916 and ending around 1970. The spread of people was because after World War I, there were more jobs, an opportunity in the North, and African Americans wanted to escape the discrimination in the South. This spread of people helped to start the Harlem Renaissance, which helped to push jazz to the front of American culture. Starting in the 1910s and ending in the 1930s, the Great Migration moved millions of New Yorkers to the North and New York was a popular destination. And Harlem was one of them. New York itself was a popular destination for people leaving the South, but Harlem became a unique neighborhood where musicians, writers, singers, and other people wanted to establish a new generation of Black culture. Female performers also found a new and larger audience in New York. But how? But their male, male counterparts were still getting better advantages. Performers such as Josephine Baker, Gladys Bentley, Alberta Hunter, and others gave the soundtrack of Harlem. The large market of Harlem in New York City allowed for vaudeville performers to transition to main stages. Artists like Ethel Waters, who we'll discuss more later, started in vaudeville as well. So for my, my first woman that I want to talk about, I will start with Valeda Snow. 
Now, not many people know who this woman is, but she was a very talented woman. She had many, many accomplishments. She was a trumpeter, singer, dancer. She knew more than a handful of instruments. And her nickname, which she promoted, was Little Lewis. This nickname was given to her by W.C. Handy because her playing style resembled those of Louis Armstrong. And we can see here, she was born June 2nd, 1904 in Tennessee, and she died May 30th in 1956. Like I said, she was born in Tennessee, and she was born to a Howard-educated mother and a father who was a minister and managed a group of child performers called the Piccaninny Troubadours. She eventually learned the trumpet from her mother and learned other music and, other, and learned other instruments such as the violin, saxophone, cello, and other string instruments. After performing in small shows as a child, she later started performing professionally in 1920. By 1924, she was in a Broadway show called The Chocolate Dandies alongside Josephine Baker. Louis Armstrong himself saw Snow perform one night and he said, boy, I never saw anything that great. The reason why her playing style was similar to Lewis and she was called Little Lewis because Lewis, as we all know, became very popular and his trumpet playing became widely known. And when Snow would perform, she could hit those high notes just like Lewis. And of course, because she was a woman playing trumpet, she became a novelty. Her playing captured audiences around the world. And she eventually started to perform in Europe and Asia. And here's a picture of here conducting a band. She was also a band leader as well. It's unfortunate that not many people know about her because she was so talented and she traveled around the world. She met so many people. She affected so many lives. But whenever we talk about musicians and jazz, we always think about the men that help to really push it forward. We don't think about the women. And I think because, the re because she played trumpet, because she was doing all these things, she was, you know, performing, she was dancing, she was singing, this kind of put her in a new space where women weren't just singers. And the trumpet, even to this day, is considered a male instrument. Even though she could play other instruments, the trumpet is what she's mostly known for. And although she traveled and she got in different places, she couldn't book large venues because many male owners didn't think people would want to see a female trumpeteer. And then also, playing the trumpet takes a lot of work, dedication, you know, practice. And in the eyes of society, playing an instrument is seen as a lot harder than singing. Singing itself is very difficult. You have to train your vocals. You have to practice consistently, just like someone who's playing an instrument. But because we can physically see someone play an instrument, you can see someone hit the drums. You can see someone play the violin. You can see someone's fingers move up and down on the guitar. And we can get the image that this person has practiced consistently and is at the top of their game because they spent hours and hours with their instrument. With singing, it's seen as though singers are born with their talent and it's regarded as not hard work when you sing in front of a crowd. But if a woman is playing an instrument like No did with the trumpet, there's the assumption that you have to play a lot to get that good. And the idea that women would be working hard and working to perfect their craft and working to make sure that they're twice as good as the guys even in the 1930s, women were not yet there in society where it was acceptable for women to 
to show that they've worked hard at something. Women were supposed to be feminine and ladylike and delicate. Playing the trumpet is not delicate. You, you're sweating, it's, you're pushing air into this metal instrument, you're walking around stage. You know, it's a very physically daunting task. And then also, during the time that Snow was traveling in the 1930s and 1940s, she was going to these venues and showing everything to everyone. But while she was away in Europe, back in the U.S., recordings were being made by Louis Armstrong and others, which helped to spread their music across the nation. But Snow was in Europe touring and she couldn't make as many recordings as her male peers. Therefore, she couldn't get her music out as much and reviewers couldn't write about it in their newspapers and their magazines, not giving her, her enough publication. So no recording means no publicity. She's not getting enough recognition as a whole to jazz history. So to show off her brilliance, I want to play a little clip. So I have to stop sharing my screen briefly. And then I can. Show you the brilliance of the latest no. Patience and forty-two, patience and forty-two, patience and forty-two, then things will come your way. When you have solid too, can make life dull and cool. Patience and forty-two, then things will come your way. Couldn't wait for the egg to hatch, used to burn both ends of a match. Couldn't wait for the cake to bake, but now I can see it's a big mistake. Patience and forty. For the sake of time, we're going to push to her trumpet play. That was Valeta Snow performing Patience and Fortitude in 1947. She had another hit song called High Hat Trumpet and Rhythm. So I know a lot of you probably don't know who this woman is, but I'm hoping with my presentation, I can give you a little bit information about her and you can look her up and read more about her story. The second woman I want to highlight is Lillian Hardin Armstrong. She was a pianist, composer, band leader, fashion designer, amongst many other things. And she was born in 1898 and passed away in 1971. Although Lil is most known for being Louis Armstrong's second wife, she had a whole life before Louis and she had a life after Louis. She was born in Memphis. She started playing the organ and reading music. She eventually moved to Chicago with her family and started working at Jones Music Store in Chicago. And she soon started learning everything there's to know about the piano. And she had a story from her youth working at the store and meeting Jelly Roll Morton. And with Jelly Roll, he came in, he started playing, and that influenced Lil to change her piano style from very light and airy to hard playing. Like I said, she's most remembered for being Louis Armstrong's second wife, but a lot of people forget the impact that she made on music. She was a composer, she was a band leader. Because she did so much, it was very difficult to people, for people to place her in this box. Women like Armstrong were pioneers in their field, but didn't get the recognition. 
And because she can't get the recognition that she deserves, it's very difficult for academics to write about her contribution to the jazz world. And I just want to list some of her accomplishments. She composed and played over dozens and dozens of songs. She led two all-women bands in the 1930s. One was called the Harlem Harlequins, starring Dolly Jones, Laura Mew, and Alma Long Scott, mother of Hazel Scott. And here's a picture of one of her bands from the 1930s from our archives. And she became the musical director at DECA starting in the 1940s. Then I have a clip that I want to play, but it, we don't have enough time for that, unfortunately. So I'll go on to Ethel Waters. She was another singer. She was also an actress. Unlike the other two women, Ethel's career has been well documented and there have been books written about her. There were plays written about her. She had a lot of accomplishments. She starred in 11 movies, had her own variety special, The Ethel Waters Show in 1939. She was the second African-American to be nominated for an Academy Award for Pinky. She became the first African-American woman to be nominated for an Emmy Award. And her connection to Lewis is that she co-starred with Lewis in Cabin in the Sky in 1943. And here is a picture, again, from our Louis Armstrong archives of Ethel Waters. Her singing style usually has been praised for the unique blend of vaudeville and blues. Like I said earlier, Waters started in vaudeville and later shifted to the main stage. In one book, an author wrote that she had a fairly direct reading of the lyric. She manipulated tone timbre and rhythm to give her delivery a permeating jazz flavor. Waters, she's been recognized, she's been honored. She has paid her dues to Hollywood, to the music industry. And although she doesn't get the recognition and the star power as her other jazz contemporaries, her accomplishments have been recognized. I also have another clip if you want to watch it. It's I Ain't Gonna Sin No More, which I'll play. Stop tempting me, you rascal, you. Ooh, nee, 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 nee. But I ain't gonna sin no more. Gonna throw one pair of loaded dice in the river right today. Gonna keep one pair of loaded dice to pay my rent and keep the wolf away. But I ain't gonna sin no more. So that was Ethel Waters thing. I ain't going to send no more. That was from a movie from the 1930s. You tell it was black and white. So I want to talk about women in jazz today. This is a photo from Vanity Fair magazine where they wrote an article about women in jazz and what has changed and what hasn't changed in the jazz industry. Today, there are festivals to showcase female talent, 
There's the Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Festival. There's actually a camp, the Jerry Allen Jazz Camp, for young people who identify as female or non-binary so they can hone their talent and get jazz mentors who are women. There are now more women playing different instruments than before, but we still have a long way to go in terms of music teachers not pushing piano or any other instrument like that. We want more girls to be playing the trombone, the saxophone, the trumpet. Jazz clubs are also becoming more inclusive to women musicians. However, the issues that Snow, Horton, and even Waters face are still happening today. There is still sexism that's happening in the music industry that limits the opportunities that women get to perform and compose music. So there was in January of this year, there was a jazz congress and they had a forum called Women in Jazz. And one of the things that they talked about was how to fix the problems of inequality in the music industry towards women. And one of the things that many people brought up was to uplift the next generation. So whenever a young woman wants to pick up an instrument and she wants to play jazz, letting her figure out what she wants to play rather than trying to pigeonhole her into a certain instrument or a certain type or a certain look and making sure that they have women mentors to show them how it's done and what's happening and things they can change going forward. So that is the end of my presentation. That's my end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. We're gonna um, move on to give uh, the word to Jovan Slaughter. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for all attending the, the Longfellow presentation. Again, my name is Jovan Slaughter. And um, throughout my time as one of the uh, Louis Armstrong Fellows for this, uh, this term of 2019-2020, uh, I've been very grateful to have a lot of help from uh, the staff members, in particular, uh, Ricky Riccardi, um, Highland Harris, uh, Adriana Philstrip, and uh, Sarah Rose, whose uh, insight and knowledge on Louis Armstrong has been very uh, crucial and my development as a uh, historian, a public historian, and uh, someone that um, takes a lot of pride in diving deep into the research that I conduct and being able to present it on forums or platforms such as this for you all today. So uh, I wanna say thank you to uh, all of them first. And then also to uh, any of the members uh, that may be viewing this now and then also um, any of the people who have come to the Armstrong House in general because the experiences there also help um, put the information that I gather into context. So for my presentation, um, uh, I'm going to be focusing on Louis Armstrong, his international travels, and using that as a vehicle to dive deep into uh, two particular questions that uh, began to arise as I was studying Louis Armstrong during the fellowship. Number one, uh, what impact did uh, international travels have on Louis Armstrong as an African American? And the second being, uh, what impact did Louis Armstrong have on the audience abroad uh, as a musician and just overall as, as, a, um, as a human being? So uh, what I'll, uh, if you bear with me, I'll get ready to uh, prepare a, um, slideshow for you all of images that um, chronicalize some of uh, Lewis's many international travels. Uh, all of these uh, images were sourced uh, from the archives uh, from Lewis's uh, collections and then the collections that were also gathered uh, over the years. So uh, as I prepare the uh, image gallery for you all, uh, I'll begin my presentation.
Okay. So I would like to present to you all uh, Jazz Abroad, the impact of the international travels of Louis Armstrong. The act of touring as a professional musician is one that is a, that an audience has come to accept as a normal regimen for artists. Performers of even minor, uh, minor nidor, not notoriety, pardon me, embark on local, national, and if lucky, international tours in order to entertain and earn a living. Before the creation of genres such as rock and roll, rhythm and blues, and pop music, jazz thrived for decades. Jazz, in many ways, was pop music, from ragtime and early traditional jazz to swing and bebop, jazz was the dominant genre of music, both in the States and abroad. Black musicians particularly had a difficult experience as touring musicians quite naturally. Black people as a collective had and still do a different ex life experience. From the turn of the 20th century, Black Americans have seen and experienced a multitude of up and ups and downs, yet few individuals live lives as remarkable and unique as Louis Armstrong. Armstrong rose to stardom in a unique period, making his life a phenomenal case study when examining Black American life in matters of extreme subjectivity and also broad shared experiences. As a musician, it is hard to argue that a larger celebrity existed during his lifetime, let alone one that was at the magnitude of global significance and influence. Armstrong toured roughly 300 days a year in a time when traveling as a black man, no matter the level of notoriety, was a challenge if being subtle and quite simply dangerous if being frank. Considering several factors that would have inherently made Louis Armstrong's traveling arduous, my research led me to think more in the realm of what social implications could be made about Armstrong's international travel. From this, a desire to understand what it may have been like to travel as extensively as Armstrong and the effects it left not just on Armstrong personally, but also the effects he left behind on international communities arose. Armstrong was by no means, was by no understatement, a genius of musical ability, but beyond the talent was a man who not only was keenly aware of his status and position in life, but one who understood the weight that came with it. Armstrong did not leave much room for speculation regarding his thoughts and feelings about many of topics throughout his life with an entire archive dedicated to his life and music. I seek to explore an intersection of these two focal points. What impact international touring had on Lewis and how did Lewis impact these international audiences? So moving um, forward to answering the question of um, what impact did Lewis, uh, Lewis's international travels have on him? I wanted to be more nuanced and really address uh, a, a very uh, particular question, which is why did Lewis uh, decide to uh, stay um, in America and make uh, America his president, uh, permanent residence and not follow a trend that we saw uh, in the mid-century of many other African-American artists uh, who had the fortunate opportunity to travel abroad and see a life outside of the U.S. that uh, really um, they didn't experience the same form of um, aggressive racism as we had in America during the 50s and 60s and also in times before that. So um, while examining that, uh, I came across uh, what, how, uh, why Lewis decided to, to stay here. So it should be a common fact uh, that life for African Americans during the first half of the 20th century was one that was faced with constant strife, racial aggression, and overall oppression. Through time, Blacks would slowly, slowly chip away at institutionalized racism and make improvements for themselves and future generations. Others would take opportunity into their own hands and seek a more immediate change in quality of life. A common thread that ran among Black artists for a time was the idea of living in Europe versus uh, the United States. Many Blacks discovered that life in cities such as Paris offered treatment that was more civil uh, and to be seen as and judged as a human being first and not by the color of their skin was a freedom that many desired. Artists such as Josephine Baker and Sidney Bechet would call France home. For Louis Armstrong, this was not something that he longed for. Perhaps it was due to the treatment that Louis received early in his tours throughout Europe, which in itself was a mixed bag of celebration and slander alike. Uh, though this is not entirely the case, 
Lewis's reasoning for staying home spoke to both sides of Armstrong, one as a black man and the other as an artist. Louis Armstrong, when needed to, could voice his opinion bluntly and publicly. At other times, he was more subtle, if not mysterious, in the way he expressed himself. Although Armstrong traveled the world many times over, his motivation for remaining stateside and not acquiring an overseas domicile reveals Louis in two aspects. Quite frankly, Louis felt that giving up on America would be a detriment to a musician in two ways. One, Louis believed that the audience would forget about the musician. And two, that musicians would fall behind the times both in talent and what was happening stateside. In the 1965 interview conducted with Dan Morgenstern at Lewis's home in Corona, Armstrong revealed why he never stayed overseas. And I'm gonna uh, quote Lewis Armstrong here. In this uh, interview, he says, see, you can stay over there just so long like a lot of them did, and then you come back here. It's a fast country. You're like five years behind the times. See, and over here, everybody keeps up with what's happening. So you go over there, you bury yourself just for the continuance and little things. So you say, well, I'm gonna go home. Boy, are you playing catch up and probably never make it. I've seen a lot of them, big shot in Paris. I won't call no names. Paris right in the palm of their hands. I'm gonna be here. What's the difference? Stay away too long. That's why when I finish my engagement, okay, let's go home now. You know, all them cats say, no man, I ain't going back. And then some of them give up their citizenship papers and things, and now we'll have to watch and see what's the difference, end quote. So clearly Lewis is not fond of uh, giving up living in America, and he felt that it was just silly for a musician to do that, and also as a person just to fall behind uh, the times and what's going on in America. And Lewis was very uh, keen and observant about the shifting uh, times that were going on in America, especially uh, given that this interview where he quoted this was 1965, Lewis uh, knew a lot of changes going on in the world and in the decades preceding that. So clearly what Lewis saw was, the, was that overall one would fall behind in talent, popularity, and with the climate of things happening in the States, perhaps Lewis in some ways was more patriotic than one would assume. His touring for the State Department and generally with any international touring, Lewis serves as an ambassador of goodwill a thoughtful and entertaining, entertaining embodiment of what the US can be, or maybe a symbol of what America contains beyond the racism and hatred. Perhaps now, given the current climate of, and the state of things in America, it is even more relevant to look at a figure such as Armstrong that refused to tolerate bigotry and racism. His track record when it comes to speaking up against racial injustice has already proven uh, itself with events such as Little Rock and the boycott of New Orleans. Given these examples, it is not, not at all surprising to learn what position Lewis took in regards to such issues. Now, looking at Lewis and his impact abroad, the prime examples that I'm using here are going to be uh, Lewis's time in Ghana and in the Belgian Congo. Um, so in May of 1965, Louis Armstrong made one of the most pivotal trips in all of his international touring escapades. Louis and his all-stars, which included Velma Middleton, Edmund Hall, Chummy Young, Billy Kyle, Barrett Deans, and Jack Lesberg, traveled to Ghana. Ghana's uh, trip is significant in a few ways in that it is a representation of how the visit impacted both the Ghanaian community and Armstrong. Firstly, the trip served as a form of diplomacy, as did many of Lewis's overseas concerts during the Cold War period. Additionally, the Ghana visit was part of a documentary that, which was captured, four, uh, which captured four weeks of Lewis in Europe, leading into the Ghana trip and his and his subsequent return to America. The documentary was released as the title "Satchmo the Great" and is filled with candid interviews and insight into Lewis's personality and tour life. As with much of Armstrong's activity. This trip to Ghana was well documented by many news outlets and would also be written in other mediums as Armstrong, after Armstrong passed. Lewis and his all-stars spent three days in Ghana, each one filled with a busy itinerary. The Pittsburgh Courier, which at one point was one of the leading African-American newspapers in the United States, wrote about Lewis's time in Ghana. Outside of the normal summary of a concert performance, journalist Horace R. Caton uh, wrote an article 
and chose to de detail the significance of Armstrong's trip and the meaning it carried with African Americans and their collective consciousness. Caton is keen to point out that despite this being Lewis's first time in Ghana, the people referred to his trip as his homecoming. In response to his trip being considered a homecoming, Lewis is quoted as saying, my ancestors came from here and I still have African blood in me. The angle of the Courier article was to highlight a solidarity and respect on both sides, observing that Lewis by default is, is a representative of the African American people and its civil rights struggles at home. At the time, Ghana was making strides to gain independence from British colonial rule, and less than a year after Armstrong's ship, Ghana would celebrate its independence on March 6th of 1957. Louis Armstrong's appearance is impactful beyond uh, being a music icon. It's still, it instills a sense of black pride that was much needed in the mid 50s. To address how Louis artistically impact uh, the overseas community, I wanted to also highlight how Lewis affected Ghana. I was not disappointed to, dis, uh, to discover that Lewis' impression on the music scene, uh, particularly with jazz, was uh, pretty impactful, actually. Um, for most Ghanaian audiences at the time, the early rag and swing uh, genres um, that were popular here in the States, um, um, pardon me, the early rag and traditional jazz music wasn't as popular as it was in the States, and the swing subgenre were more, more popular. And as fate would have it, when uh, the Ghanaian audience got a taste of Lewis's Dixieland jazz during his first concert performance, the general audience uh, didn't really get the typical rave reviews that we expect, but the jazz musicians themselves really liked Lewis's sound. They found it very unique and different from what they were accustomed to. And overall, mainly trumpeters uh, and vocalists gravitated towards Lewis's traditional jazz styles. E.T. Mensa, who at the time was arguably the most famous trumpet player in Ghana, commented on Lewis's impact. Mensa stated that trumpet players began to study and use Lewis's phrasing, and even singers attempted to mimic his distinct gravelly voice. In Ghana, the traditional music is called high life, and those bands began to incorporate traditional jazz tunes into their repertoire. An example being the high life group, The Tempos, playing St. Louis blues at their shows. Ghana gave Lewis and his band, the All Stars, a red carpet treatment, and there were many attributing factors which would have left an impact on Lewis's band, but none more than Edmund Hall. Edmund Hall apparently took his experience to heart and was motivated to return. And within a year of the Ghana tour, Edmund Hall set out to create his own jazz band in Ghana, made up entirely of Ghanaian musicians. This venture did not end well. It actually failed in less than a year for Edmund. And he returned to the States, uh, citing multiple incidences uh, that which led to the failure of the band. But nonetheless, it really shows that the cultural bonds uh, definitely made an impact on Edmund and the Ghanaians uh, on both sides of the spectrum during their time there. Multiple cultural exchanges were made uh, during the Ghana tour, and one of which occurred right as Lewis was set to leave the country. While departing the airport, Armstrong was seen off with music from the Ghanaian high life group called the Rackers Band. The band performed a song entitled All For You. Lewis reportedly recognized the song as an old Creole melody that dated back to the turn of the century. Speculation as to whether the roots of uh, the song All For You was a Ghanaian song brought to America via the slave trade, or, it was, or whether it was brought to the former Gold Coast at some point later is really a diasporic mystery, but nonetheless, it showcases uh, the shared musical lineage and tradition between uh, West Africa and that of the United States and the diaspora as a whole. Earlier, I alluded to the diplomatic purposes that Louis Armstrong's travel serve. Though this is not uh, the key part of this research, it is unavoidable in some cases. And this is most particular in the case of 1961, when Louis returned to Ghana, a young, uh, famous, or would be famous Ghanaian artist named Ku Nemo attended Lewis's concert in Kumasi. Nemo is a highly influential high life artist and reflected many years after Armstrong passed on the importance of Lewis and the world of global politics. 
Nemo stated that as an Amer uh, excuse me, America uses its sportsmen and musicians and world politics, and in the heat of the Soviet American tensions, it was the music of Louis Armstrong that saved the situation. So from uh, Nemo, uh, really high words of praise. In October of 1960, Armstrong performed several shows in quick succession in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Upon Louis's arrival, he was dubbed Okuka Lokole, which translates to the jungle wizard who casts spells with a voice like ringing bells. Uh, the Congolese people embraced Lewis immediately, who during these times uh, sorely needed something to uplift their spirits. And famously, Lewis' uh, arrival created a temporary ceasefire during a civil war. Paul Hoffman, a writer for the New York Times service Leopold, reported on just how desperately a moment of peace and goodwill was appreciated, saying that some 10,000 people attended a stadium concert to see Lewis. And Hoffman says that Armstrong calls UN soldiers, Congolese people, Congolese soldiers, and others to fraternize with each other for once. Another description of Armstrong's impact on the Congo comes from a UN field reporter stating that Louis Satchmo Armstrong brought the first happy event to this trouble-torn city since the independence of June uh, 30th. We have wide evidence that the Congolese appreciated this friendly gesture by the US and that the impact of his visit will leave a sweet taste in Leopoldville for a long time to come. Lewis, who was at times purposefully, uh, who purposefully decided to refrain from making political statements aware of the weight that his statements carried, continued to travel to locales that entirely, inherently carried political baggage. One could assume that Lewis had his own modus operandi with many of the international tours, and no stranger to political games, Lewis remained detached from baiting questions from the press, stating, I don't have time for politics, I just blow my horn. However, during the Congo tour, Lewis received a cablegram inviting him to Russia. To this, Lewis cheekily responded with a grin and, quote, I serve humanitarily purposes generally, end quote. Lewis is a very nuanced and complex figure to study. His humble beginnings left many questions uh, for future generations to ruminate over. Throughout my time as a fellow, uh, it's been very multi-layered with questions that led me to understand on a deeper level who Louis Armstrong really was. The facade and caricature of Lewis is often perceived as the real life person, but this is far from the truth. And once one is able to comprehend the magnitude of Lewis, the celebrity and the star power, and the sheer number of astounding accomplishments that he made, once you can accept that as part of who he was and what he did, then you can really begin to dive in deep to who Lewis was as a person and the humanity begins to come more into clarity. We're able to understand why Lewis Armstrong lived the way he did and took certain stances on issues that pertain not only to him, but to African Americans as a whole. Simply put, through Lewis, we can get a multi-layer perspective of black life. So thank you all um, for hearing my exposition on Lewis. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it over to Adriana. Thank you. So thank you, Jovan. Uh, we are going to now open uh, the board for questions. Uh, if uh, you have a question, you can um, send it to us via chat. Either a question for the museum staff or the fellows directly. So we have a question from E.J. Adler. Uh, what was the highlight of your fellowship? Uh, I guess that's for both. Um, so each can take a minute to answer that. 
I mean, I can start. Um, I think the highlight of my fellowship, um, well, I like to split it into two. So our fellowship, we would spend one week at the House Museum, and the next week we would spend at the archives. So when I was at the house, I think the highlight of my fellowship was, you know, meeting the different people that would come into the museum and sometimes a lot of them had, you know, they heard of Armstrong, but they had never, you know, really engaged with him and seeing their expression walking through the house and they're seeing everything for the first time. That was always really special. And then when working at the archives with Ricky Riccardi and Sarah Rose, it was a really cool experience uh, walking through the stacks and seeing all of Lewis's personal things and all that he left behind, his records, his statues, his, uh, you know, his writings, which are so personal, his collages, which I encourage everyone to look at, you know, how he thought, how he saw the world. I think what we have at the archives is so fascinating and interesting. Yeah, um, for me, I would say, uh, I mean, my sentiments pretty much are uh, the same as my colleagues, but in particular for me, um, interacting with the public was uh, the main highlight. Um, I've actually made uh, connections outside of the museum from the patients who came through. Um, I've had people tell me that, you know, they've uh, been to the museum many of times before, but you know, never had uh, an experience like they had uh, when I was able to give them a tour, they learned much more. So it's really, for me, um, a big part of it is the, the human interaction. Um, and um, also um, to a lesser degree, um, but not to diminish the impact it had on my studies was uh, working, in, working in the archives, which was um, very insightful and uh, getting a glimpse into um, that side of the world of history, um, working with the collections daily and with researchers who would come in and of course uh, working with the uh, people there, Ricky and uh, Sarah alike, um, were uh, very insightful experiences for me. Adriana, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you both. Um, another question for Jess here uh, from Alicia Jenkins. Jess, thank you for your presentation. In your studies, did you identify any organization leveraging social media to promote and support female jazz artists? If you having, in what ways uh, would you leverage these platforms to promote these women? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Ms. Jenkins. Very good question. Um, well, throughout my studies for this presentation, I was mostly looking at uh, women from the 20s and 30s. And when I was looking at women in jazz today, uh, I saw that a lot of them actually use social media in terms of Facebook, Instagram, I don't know, Twitter, what have you. I think that self-promotion helps them a lot in terms of putting their music out and then also you know there were you know groups on these social media platforms facebook groups you know instagram groups what have you that allowed women to collectively come together and have a greater voice and advocate for themselves on a larger level then instead of going to a studio head or going to a club owner individually they could come together and promote themselves collectively as a group um, so I think, yeah, I think social media itself, I think you can directly interact with people, directly interact with fans, uh, potential employers, you know, club owners, record producers, stuff like that. You have a greater voice in reaching your music to such a wide audience before you had to rely on getting a record deal and maybe getting a recurring spot in the club. Now you can put your music on YouTube, you can put your music on Instagram, on Twitter, you can put it everywhere that you can in order to get your music out there. So it's more freeing this way when you have social media than back in the day. But thank you for your question. Thank you.
Um, another interesting question here, uh, especially for both of you um, and your generation. Uh, what do you think a new generation of young people uh, who do not know Louis Armstrong should know about him uh, that will make them value who Louis Armstrong was? That's from Jeff Rosenstock. Yeah, I guess I'll go first with this one. Um, one of the things that I think the current generation, my generation and, and below really should know about Lewis is um, one that there's more than meets the eye. He is not the image that you see when you look, do a quick Google search of Lewis Armstrong. Um, he is a very, uh, you know, uh, multi-layered, multi-faceted person, a uh, very, um, interesting life. He's a person who wrote two autobiographies um, and the manuscript for another uh, book who was pretty much self-educated. He never finished elementary school and uh, did many amazing things, but uh, I would say that one of the things that young people will probably find interesting about Lewis, in my opinion, the most is that uh, his is really his level of celebrity and how he navigated that that celebrity um, you could really see some of the things that Lewis did as an archetype for the people who would come after him, uh, other African Americans uh, who would come after him, regardless whether they were musicians or athletes. Uh, I see a lot of comparisons in what Lewis stood for and how he used his platform in the similar ways in which how Muhammad Ali would use it, or in a more relevant terms, how somebody like LeBron James could use his platform and speak against uh, issues that are, funny enough, the same things that Lewis spoke out against and received backlash for, not much has really changed when we look at the grand scheme of things and that uh, the current climate of America right now, um, we see that we have people protesting now in the streets uh, over the outrage in which how African Americans are treated and Lewis spoke out against these very same things and was basically told to shut up and blow his horn similar to shut up and dribble, you know? So I think people could really learn from Lewis and um, how he definitely uh, stood up for his people in the face of adversity at the detriment of his own career. Yeah, and I think that what, you know, young people could look at Lewis. I think, you know, the man worked extremely hard. He was on the road for 300 plus days out of the year. That means you're traveling, you're performing, you're interacting with people on a constant basis. And a lot of young people today are all about, you know, hustling and grinding to make their name in music. And Lewis did exactly that. I think a lot of times when people reach a certain level of icon, so to speak, they don't acknowledge that it took a lot of hard work to get there. And I think, you know, Lewis had to do it before, you know, social media, before the internet. So he was really hustling to make a name for himself, you know, to distinguish himself from the other trumpet players from New Orleans, from the other trumpet players around the world. So I think Lewis and how he hustled and worked hard and made a name for himself. And, you know, he started out, he wasn't always a solo star. He started, started out playing, you know, second trumpet with King Oliver. And then he broke out as a solo artist. You know, if you're going from a background person to front and center, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. You have to work really, really hard and be extremely dedicated to not only your craft, but to make sure that, you know, people come to the shows. You know, if you're going to have a band, he was a band leader. That means, you know, making sure that, you know, your band shows up on time, that they're practicing, that, you know, that you can get venues. It's levels and levels of hard work that I think that young people can really appreciate today. You know, he didn't, you know, Lewis just didn't fall out of the sky successful. It was years and years and he didn't do it by himself. So he always had a team behind him to make sure that he could accomplish his goals. So I think that's what young people can take from Lewis. This next question is for Jovan. Um, uh, what parallels did you see uh, when uh, exploring Lewis's life versus artists today in regards uh, social 
issues impacting uh, the artistry? Hmm. Um, well, that's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I guess, uh, to be frank, uh, there's a lot of parallels that um, you can draw uh, between Lewis and in the present day, um, mainly because of the fact that Lewis uh, truly really is like the first music celebrity um, in a lot of ways. And so to specifically address uh, the parallels of, um, if I'm remembering the question correctly, uh, the parallels between uh, what Lewis experienced and how, uh, what artists experience today and how they affected the, the artistry, like the actual music that they produce. Um, hmm. yeah, well, one, it, I guess it would depend on which artists we're looking at in the current scope of things, right? Um, when I think about the greats, I think about artists like uh, Prince and, um, you know, Marvin Gaye, uh, Stevie Wonder, um, guys like that, you know, and in the current generation, I would say, uh, particularly when I look at things like hip hop, look at the J. Coles, the Kendricks, um, the, uh, the more elder statesman at this point, uh, Nasir Jones, you know, guys like that, who, what they gave, what these people gave you was initially their story. They gave you their life, what they came from. They gave you a really raw and honest reality. Though Lewis stood on stage and he sang a lot of standards and famous uh, blues numbers and, you know, the traditional jazz numbers, Lewis also really uh, innovated in a lot of ways with the way he implemented scat music into his, uh, uh, his music early in his career. And also one of the things that Lewis would do was that he would change lyrics in his songs to address a certain issue when he needed to. Uh, a good example is the song Black and Blue. And the lyrics are, I'm white inside, but that don't help my case. And Lewis would change that to say things like, I'm right inside, you know, but that doesn't help my case. What did I do to be so black and blue? Really showcasing that, you know, I, here I am in front of you. I am this artist. I am a black man. I'm a human being. You love me in one light, but if you treat me wrong, you treat my people wrong, you know, then why, like, really, why are you, do, why are you like this? What did, what did we do other than just be ourselves to be born to be human? And really forcing the audience and the listener to accept, you know, either any hypocrisies they may have uh, to really see the humanity in us and all of us, because you can't, you know, like you said, you can't just really love one of us and hate the rest of us, you know, even though he did on record say that, hey, you know, races, they always got that, their, their favorite black person, but they don't like the rest of them. They always got that one they like, you know, but, um, you know, Lewis was very honest, but I think um, that's really what he did with the music. You know, he changed the music to really uh, showcase what he was going through. And I think we see that now with, you know, pivotal albums that come out in recent years, uh, Pimple Butterfly, you know, that, that's a good example of the parallels between how Kendrick was able to really uh, use that album to showcase um, what he really went through. And then also that element of fame and how that affected his personal life. But, you know, Lewis dealt with the same things. It's, instead of having social media and access to us, Lewis, he had, um, you know, manuscripts, letters, tapes, he documented himself. And, you know, he did that for people to understand for later. He knew that he had that clairvoyance that, you know, this needs to be here for a reason. And this is why I'm leaving this material. Uh, somebody's going to read this one day. Somebody's going to listen to this one day. Somebody's going to learn from this. And I'm just putting this here so that I can help the next person. Just like the people who came before Lewis helped him. He always said that the best artists were the guys that we never got to hear because they never got to record. The people that he grew up listening to on the streets, the people that he heard in the clubs and, you know, the, the guys who came before him. So he always paid homage. And I think that um, is those parallels when you see these great artists who always talk about the people who came before them that made it possible for them to do what they do. Uh, to end, I guess, the quote that comes to mind now is what Miles Davis said about Lewis. He said, Lewis bowed and scraped and wiped his, you know, forehead like the sweat off his forehead with that handkerchief so that he could turn his back to the audience and play his horn and be cool. You know, uh, that's what Miles said about Lewis. So uh, I see that parallel between great artists always paying homage and also addressing what's uh, always prevalent um, in the current situation of things. 
Thank you, Jovan. And uh, I'm gonna ask um, Hylin or Ricky um, to help us with the next question. Um, there's, uh, Joshua is curious about the, um, the manuscripts and after writing two autobiographies, there's, there's actually um, only two autobiographies and, and the Louis Armstrong House Museum holds the manuscript for the second um, attempt, which is uh, Satchmo, My Life in New Orleans. Um, uh, the question is, did something change in his self-interpretation or self-presentation? Was he recasting himself for new generations? Want me to take a stab at that? <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Uh, great first off, great job to the both fellows, Jazz and Jovan. It was uh, just terrific. Uh, I'll jump in here real quick. Uh, Lewis's first autobiography, Swing That Music, um, was actually written with a uh, ghost writer, uh, Horace Gerlach, and Swing Music was blown up. It was early 1936. Lewis's manager, Joe Glazer, got a deal. Lewis and Gerlach, who was one of his arrangers, uh, work together. But when you read that book, it's mostly Gerlach. There's a lot of ghost written passages about Mark Twain and the original Dixieland jazz band and stuff like that, that Lewis never touched at any other point in his career. There's some good stuff there, but uh, it's more of a historic kind of thing that it's the first autobiography of a black jazz musician. Uh, so God bless it. It's okay. Um, but Satchmo, My Life in New Orleans, as Adriana mentioned, that's really the big one. That's the one where Lewis uh, wrote every single word himself. Um, we have that manuscript and it ends in 1922 when he joins King Oliver's band, because to me that was the, the high point of his career. You know, everything after that was kind of gravy. Uh, he submitted to his editor in Prentice Hall. They did a, a light edit and Adriana could tell you more about that. She did her whole thesis on that subject. Um, but overall, it's really him. It's him, you know, telling you what he wants you to know about those early days and the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all there, but you're getting the real man. Uh, the third manuscript is the unfinished one, and that one requires a lot of context. And the context is Lewis was dying. It was 1969. He was in intensive care in Beth Israel for the second time in six months. And he was in a really dark place. He was dark because he believed his black fan base had abandoned him unfairly. Um, he was just, like I said, you know, almost staring death in the eye. And so he starts writing this thing in Beth Israel Hospital. His manager, Joe Glazer, dies. And he kind of just, uh, Brent Hayes Edwards has written about it, almost like a purge. You know, like he has these dark feelings. He talks about how, you know, he always did thought he did great things to uplift his people, was never appreciated for it. Uh, he criticizes his own people. He criticizes a lot of stuff. And um, he also, in the third book, is this is the time he really writes about the Jewish family, the Kronofsky family. Uh, they don't really appear in his other books, so he wants to make sure that that story is told. He tells the story of getting his first cornet because of the Jewish family, which is not in the original books. So you kind of have to compare all three books um, seventy-five percent stays the same, but there are these there are these changes. And yeah, like I said, um, like I said, is he really reevaluating himself, or you know, for a new generation? There's some of that. The third one, though, I don't think I don't know what his plans were for that because he does get out of intensive care. He gets out of the hospital, and then the whole second half of that manuscript. He's reminiscing about New Orleans musicians and talking about the drummers in New Orleans. And he kind of like, you know, moves away from the, the dark beginning. So that is kind of like a snapshot into his mind. But besides those three books, you have to add in, you know, we have smaller autobiographical manuscripts. We have chapters about his neighborhood in Queens, his chap chapter about uh, getting his hair cut at the local barbershops, uh, letters to his fans, letters to friends that we have dozens and dozens of. I think you have to kind of go from 1922, the first surviving letter, till 1971, the last, the open letter to his fans, which was written about 16 days before he died. Um, and then you kind of get 
part of the story, but you'll never get you'll never get the full story, even though we all try, all of us here. So stay still, uh, because this one is uh, a little bit of a broader question by Christina. Um, and if I understand it well, uh, she's asking about um, Louis Armstrong and um, um, all their, the female contributors of this time, but in general, I guess, uh, this generation, I, I think we can um, narrow it down to the performers of the 20th century. What descriptor can be used on all these performers? Is there something maybe that we can, um, since you taught a full class on this period, uh, maybe you can share with us something that they share in common, uh, this generation. The the current generation or the the history? I'm sorry, I, I need to read the question. Oh, uh, okay, here it is. <laughs> I got it. After researching so much on Lewis and female contributors, oh, do you see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, what descriptor can be used on all these performers? You know, I'm actually going to pass the ball. I think the question is being aimed at jazz. Jazz, do you want to jump in on this one? Uh, yeah, I could. I could jump in briefly before you give a a very long explanation. Um, I would say that the descriptor that we can use, you know, Lewis and these female contributors are, you know, I was thinking like innovators. You know, these performers created jazz, which you know, help to branch off into so many other genres that we know today. So, you know, the playing style, the culture of jazz really helped to create what we know today is this American culture. So I think, you know, Lewis and these female contributors, I would call them innovators. They were doing things that, you know, people weren't really doing before in the history of, you know, the U.S. and it spread all around the world. and you know, created new cultures in different countries, you know, with different languages. I would think that, you know, someone who's doing stuff that hasn't been documented, that's an innovator to me. Yeah, I mean, there's really not much more I, I, can, I can add to that. Um, I mean, all these musicians, the, the, the female musicians Jazz mentioned, you know, the crime of it is that they're not household names like a Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington or a, or a Miles Davis, but they innovated, you know, they, they broke barriers, they put up with hell, they did everything that the male counterparts were, were going through. And so I think, you know, round of applause for jazz for, for shining the spotlight on them because, you know, the innovations are there for us all to see. All you have to do is listen to the music, watch those YouTube videos and their work speaks for itself. So. Thank you, Jazz. I guess uh, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask my own question because uh, we saw uh, Jovan sharing some of our jewels in the collections, and um, I would want him to tell us a little bit of what's on those photos. Um, as I said at the beginning, um, I think one of our Pride is to have the largest collection for a single jazz musician around the world, and that and that uh, brings to us plenty of researchers that come back and uh, and, and pull up projects, even even though uh, sometimes they're not directly about Louis Armstrong, but uh, the the Louis Armstrong collections uh, helps to put the pieces together. So. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, Jovan, would you uh, like to tell us what was going on a little bit in some of those photos, uh, specifically? Yeah, certainly. Um, I can, uh, would you like me to pull up that slide again? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Just give me a second, everyone, uh, to get myself here. Ready? Okay, so, all right, everybody can see that? 
Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, for example, um, I'll try to go through some of them that uh, this one, the first one that you saw uh, just since it's already up on the screen, uh, this one is uh, Lewis in London. Um, actually, I'm sorry, uh, Paris. And I believe that's Hugh Panassier, who was a very influential uh, writer, jazz critic, historian, um, lover of, uh, of all things jazz. He loved Louis Armstrong to death. He even named his son Louis after him. So um, he was a very uh, strong proponent of Louis's um, music. Um, a lot of what I wanted to show uh, throughout the slides, uh, here's Louis and his wife, uh, his last wife, Lucille, uh, with Hugh again uh, there in uh, Paris. But uh, Louis, I really wanted to show like that he really went all over the world. Um, sadly, I couldn't get all of the photos that I wanted to in this slide. But as you see there at the Coliseum here with um, Lucille, uh, the, you know, the um, pyramids of, of Giza and Sphinx. Um, that's a very famous photo of Lewis. That one's from our collection as well. Some people may be familiar with that shot. Um, I like the more off the, you know, beaten path type of things, like uh, especially Lewis's tours of Japan. Um, I did a whole blog post about uh, Lewis's time in Japan, and I found that to be one of the most fascinating uh, things that Lewis did, mainly because of the embrace that he received. And just to give you all um, some context here, um, uh, in which like how Japanese people uh, received Lewis, Lewis actually, uh, I'm not sure that the, the girl, young girl posted in this photo, is uh, who I'm about to mention, but Lewis actually has photographs with the emperor's daughter, and she's backstage, um, sitting on Lewis's lap, taking a photo. And you know, there's lots of other Japanese people, you know, from the uh, of the royal family, uh, really just sitting around Louis Armstrong, just happy to that he's in Japan. But one of the coolest things about that, this is the marquee, as you can see, that they set up. This was uh, custom built just for one date that Lewis performed at that theater. You know, like stuff like this, when you think about um, 1958, I believe, uh, so only like about nine years or so after the end of World War II and the surrender of Japan. And here Lewis is an African-American selling out every single theater in Japan. And at the time, breaking the record for attendance at every theater that he performed at. And also one of the other big things that Lewis did during these uh, tours of Asia was that he went to, um, the um, military bases and performed and received a lot of money there. So you want to talk about a patriot, you know, Lewis is going to the military bases and he's one of the A-list celebrities performing for the GIs in an occupied country after the end of the war when our American, other American, you know, music superstars weren't even doing this, weren't even going overseas to see the troops. And here's Lewis giving them this show, which really speaks volumes to who he was as a, as a human. Uh, this is Lewis in London, uh, getting off the plane. Um, in London as well, when I'm not mistaken. Uh, another photos of Lewis with children backstage in uh, in Japan. Another uh, image on um, for a poster, and I want to show you guys um, some of the ones from Ghana. So this was Lewis in the Ghana tour. Uh, they're kind of mixed up. Um, this is Italy, uh, but that's uh, him with Prime Minister Kwame Nkrumah. You know, um, or at the time would be Prime Minister uh, Kwame Nkrumah. Uh, Ghana wasn't formed. During this pic uh, when this picture was taken, but it was still uh, formerly Gold Coast, but um, him with uh, some officials, uh, Trummy Young, uh, some members of the band with Lewis there. Uh, this is uh, them playing tabletop uh, ice hockey with the <laughs> prime minister. So there's like really lots of amazing candid photos um, and just really am amazing things that Lewis uh, has in his archives, some uh, taken, um, uh, by uh, other people, some from his personal collection. But um, yeah, I guess without taking up too much time, that's kind of like some of uh, the stuff that was that I came across. Hi, Lynn. Hey, I just wanted to say hello and I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, listening to this uh, conversation. And I wanted to give a very special thanks to Adriana for helping put this together and Javon and Jazz. Like I said, it was, a, it was an honor working with both of you. Uh, gonna miss you in a couple of weeks. Uh, but I wanted, to, I wanted to talk a little bit about, just briefly, 
uh, it was mentioned earlier. I don't know who asked the question about reaching out to younger audiences. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out is that it's kind of important for younger audiences to have a greater appreciation for an understanding of history and how history is being interpreted. That's uh, very important. And I think one of the great things about having this archives and Lewis in particular was, was that he was such an icon and such a shining light and he was such a singular figure. And to have all of his writings, uh, his recordings, photographs in one location allows us to look historically at who this man was and how celebrity was appreciated over the course of 60 years. Uh, and so when we talk about things like reaching out to younger people, one thing that every generation does is they try to recontextualize uh, creativity and every generation, that's actually kind of the mission statement for every generation, it's their, it's their responsibility. Uh, so sometimes I'll hear catchphrases like a new black renaissance. And usually when you hear phrases like that, they're usually underinformed or kind of kitschy. And I say that in the sense of because every black, every generation, 20s, 30s, and 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way to today, have had very singular figures who challenged the status quo and uh, became successful, and then they became the establishment, and then the next generation would have the responsibility to challenge whoever, Prince. Before Prince, it was Sly Stone, and so on like that. And Lewis, the great thing about Lewis is that we have a person who went through many waves of these kind of innovations, and he was able to adapt over the course of his long career. And I always say this, like uh, Lewis was the first jazz musician to have a number one hit. He was the last jazz musician to have a number one hit. Uh, and he's the only person in history that hits in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, What a Wonderful World was a hit again, 1986. So that's 50, 60 years of hits. Uh, he did not change being who he was throughout the period, that period of all of those hits. That record will not be broken because people aren't really buying records anymore. Uh, so when we reach out to younger people, particularly we have to show, and it's really kind of one of our unstated mission statements at the Louis Armstrong House Museum is to reach out to younger people, is to show here's a person who didn't change uh, who he was, he wore a tuxedo all the way through the 60s uh, and was able to maintain large audiences, maintain a, an extremely uh, varied and extensive recording career. Uh, and his innovations continued over the course of his life. Uh, a lot of great artists cannot say that. And I think that's something that younger uh, audiences really need to understand in the context because it, it will be their it will be their responsibility to challenge what is the status quo and create something cure cancer, fly to the moon, like it's on them and it's up to us to challenge them and encourage them. That's it. Thank you, Highland. And uh, well, I want to thank our fellows uh, for their work uh, today, and uh, thank you to thank thanks to each of you for joining us uh, on this hour and a half or so. Um, please stay connected. Our um, on, online exhibit is available um, to be searched uh, at any time. You can. Uh, follow our social media pages. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also visit our website 
louisarmstronghouse.org. We definitely want to see all of your faces back at the house uh, once um, it's safe and um, um, we can all see each other again. So thank you all. And we hope to see you soon.